concentrating uh, solar for Chevron so they can do some oil extraction there. But this thing was massive. I mean, I could see it from the airplane. Like I said, it was the size of Kalinga. Maybe Kalinga's not that big, but it looked, looked pretty big to me. Anyway, so that's one kind of, you know, you know, move the desert tortoises out of the way and put in the solar panels or put the big wind turbines up in the mountain pass. Um, that's, that can be challenging, though. You need transmission lines out to these places. You do have these endangered species concerns. Uh, the permitting process has been a pain. So here's an example. This is from someone who works at uh, worked at Solar Millennium. They worked on a Blythe uh, solar project. And this was actually just, they had two bookshelves that looked like this. This was the permit uh, for their, for their um, for their project, and I've got a timeline here. You can't, I'm sure you can't see all the details here, but basically, you know, Blythe and Palin, two projects here. You know, basically, the original application filed in end of 06 here for Blythe. You know, finally executed in uh, November 4th, 2010. It's four years. You know, and then you got August 07, down the first quarter of 2011. And the process has improved a bit, but you can see there's just a lot of challenges with the big central station solar. So uh, we focus more on our work at, at the UCs on uh, what's called distributed or localized uh, clean energy, distributed generation. And just to kind of give a quick definition, so the distribution grid is essentially everything, all the electricity lines on wood, and that's kind of a simple way to look at it, as opposed to the big transmission lines. So some people say it's 20 megawatts or less, uh, but we like to think of it as on-site or close to load. It's close to where people are actually using the electricity. Interconnected to the grid, it can be uh, wind, solar, biomass. You don't need the transmission lines. Uh, you can, you know, you can deploy it immediately because you don't have this, you know, the same permitting concerns in a lot of cases that you would have with some of the large central station stuff. And some of the studies we've seen have shown that it can provide up to 128 to 213 percent of uh, offsite of this large central uh, station type of renewable energy. So I, I, ultimately, you need a mix in California. I'm not trying to say we that we don't need large scale. The governor's goal is that of the 20,000 megawatts we need in California to come from renewable energy, which is which equals the 33 percent, that we want 12,000 of that to come from this distributed generation, or this localized clean energy, and then the other 8,000 can come from large scale. So it's it's going to be a mix, but there's a lot of a lot of benefits in terms of permitting and efficiency um, and land usage to having it be more distributed. And some of the kind of quick policy ideas behind it. it, it trying to encourage more DG, as it's abbreviated to, is figuring out a better utility payment plans. Does any, anyone in this room have solar panels on the roof? A few folks. So all of you get retail credit, right? You, know, you never get a check sent to you. So that's what's called the net metering program, where basically you have solar panels on your roof, it's not going into your house, it's, it's going into the grid. And then what happens is that your utility gives you a retail credit, so your electricity bill is reduced by whatever amount you're producing. And over a year, it'll kind of account for all of your electricity usage and all the energy you provide, and it'll kind of do it kind of a true up. Um, that's one model, and it's certainly important in California. It's led to a lot of these residential home uh, installations. The other model is called the feed-in tariff. If you ever go to Germany, I haven't been, but I've talked to people who do. You fly in, there's solar on almost, you know, I shouldn't say every rooftop, but it's, it's ubiquitous. I mean, they're the real leader in rooftop solar. It's because they have this feed-in tariff program. It's a terrible name. I think it's uh, some well, well, wealthy foundation spent a lot of money to rebrand it, and I think their acronym now is CLEAN, uh, CLEAN Local Energy Accessible Now, something like that. So if you want to call it that, go ahead. Uh, feed-in tariff, though, is a terrible name, but basically what it means is you get a cash payment. No more retail credit. You actually get cash for the energy you provide. And it's great for certain businesses, like let's say you're a warehouse, where you don't have a lot of on-site energy usage. So with solar panels, if they reduce your energy bill, it doesn't matter. If you have a huge roof, you're producing so much electricity that the credit doesn't mean much to you. But if you can get paid for that, it's a whole great revenue stream. So you can get commercial rooftops going, you can get parking lots, all sorts of things. And, and we do have models, payment models, to make that happen now. But feed-in tariffs are a very elegant way to do it, even if they're not elegantly named. And uh, we now have one in California, but we have, haven't had one for a while that is pretty ineffectively priced. And there's this reverse auction type of fee and tariff now that the Public Utilities Commission is exploring. It's kind of wonky, so I won't go into details, but if you're interested, you know, you can write down reverse auction mechanism, PUC, and Google it, and then it'll explain it all to you. Uh, so that's the, the utility kind of payment plans are critical. I think second, it's about standardized permitting, the permitting process for doing this with the patchwork of local government uh, jurisdictions could be confusing, 
uh, Germany, you know, I've seen slides where they have, you know, you saw my permit slide there, you know, just to get a, your home energy uh, system set up, it's a big stack of paper. In Germany, it's something like two pages, you know, you sign on the bottom there. So we need to get to that level. Um, interconnection process with utilities, you know, to sign up to, to, to interconnect with the grid. It's kind of a black box for most people, the developers who are in the, in the uh, industry, and figuring out a way to really prioritize interconnection for the projects where we want to see them and trying to make it a more transparent process, I think would be helpful. And then finally, when we talk about this 12,000 megawatt goal the governor's office has, it's going to involve a lot of planning. And that's local planning, so local governments need to include kind of a renewable energy forecast in their land use plans. So I talked earlier about the plans for their downtowns. Well, I think they should also be planning for where renewable energy is going to go in the community. And then that should coordinate with regional plans for energy deployment, and then all that needs to be synced up with what the utilities are planning, because you don't want to just plan for that in a vacuum. You know, we want to put this stuff where we, where we have the capacity on the grid, where we already have the existing distribution and transmission lines to hook in and, and make it as efficient as possible. So that we might take home points uh, for that, for renewable energy. And then I want to talk, the last subject I want to talk about, and I'll, I'll be brief on this one since we're at the pie chart wedges are getting more narrow now, uh, is, is what we're going to do about integrating this energy, this renewable energy. So the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow, it's variable intermittent energy that we're starting to rely on more and more. And you know, utilities, if you listen to them, they, they freak out because you know, this is threatening reliability, we don't want blackouts. I think there's a lot of merit to that. I have this uh, uh, chart here that I pulled off the web for a profile of a you know, solar energy day. So you can see the sun rising and setting, but you know, clouds pass over, you know, maybe a rainstorm can, comes through, that sort of thing. You, know, you have huge dips. And it's, it's, you know, right now they say, well, we can manage this fine. We don't need any new amazing breakthroughs. But the problem is when they talk about how to manage it, a lot of it boils down to natural gas to, to compensate for this variability. And some of the studies that we've seen indicate that if, you, know, you start to use natural gas enough to do this kind of compensation, you're almost to the point where you're neutralizing your greenhouse gas benefits. So all these renewables we're putting online, if we're using natural gas to fill in the, 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 the uh, dips, it's, it's going to be a real problem. So we've looked at energy storage as really it's called the holy grail of, uh, of, of clean tech, and I think of trying to have a more renewable, sustainable grid. So energy storage, I think the common uh, visual behind it would be a battery, basically a way to capture energy when it's, when it's produced, and then dispatch it at a time when you really need it. So for example, if you have wind blowing at night and the wind turbines are really going, but everyone's asleep, you know, maybe they're charging their iPhones or whatnot, but you don't have a big load, you, what you need to do is, is capture that and then use it during the hottest part of the day when everyone's cranking their air conditionings, air conditioning units. So that's, that's just you know, a very simplistic example. Um, but if we can capture that intermittent energy, you know, a solar farm could have on-site energy storage, and then instead of just feeding that kind of intermittent energy into the grid, it can capture it and provide a smooth output that would mimic some of the generating stations that we already have. If we move towards a more decentralized source of energy uh, generation, then we may have, need more on-site, you know, customer, community-centered energy storage, battery units that the neighborhoods are sharing. Uh, I shouldn't just say batteries, there's other technologies. We use them already. Pumped hydro is a mature energy storage technology. When I say pumped hydro, I'm talking about uh, moving water kind of at different elevation ranges. So uh, how many people here have driven by Pyramid Lake on I-5 going down to Los Angeles? So you can know, see the little kind of pyramid looking thing there. It's, it's a, that's a pumped hydro system right there. So there's two reservoirs at different uh, elevations. And at night when energy is cheap, they sometimes will pump water uphill. And then they'll release it uh, downhill during the middle of the day. And they, it's called arbitrage because it's cheaper electricity at night. And even though it's not as energy, you lose some of the energy pumping uphill, you don't sound a perfect recapture, you end up making money doing it that way. Uh, that's how some of the California State Water Project works. We all know, uh, being here in Northern California, that Southern California steals our water. This is my uh, UC, um, Berkeley hat talking, uh, since I'm a, I think I'm in a friendly audience. So we, we ship a lot, I shouldn't say that, they get a lot of water from the Colorado River and other places, and groundwater. But anyways, they're, they're ship, we're shipping water down to Southern California, and we do it uh, via... Uh, the San Luis Reservoir, um, it, it's kind of by Monterey, but towards the Central Valley, and we, we pump that water uphill, and then we have to get it back downhill to a higher elevation, and we try to recapture some of that energy. It's not really exactly a pumped hydro system in the way we think of it, but it's a way to keep the California State Water Project from using so much electricity. That's another example. Flywheels, spinning disks, 
uh, multiple vent battery technologies, compressed air, energy storage is another one where you pump air into a cavern and then uh, pressurize it. It could be maybe instead of a cavern, just some sort of contained structure and release it when you need that energy. That's the question. If, if you have more of the, the distributed localized, does that smooth out some of these, these peaks and valleys in that it may be sunny over here, not over here, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, but on average, the, the amount of energy going into the grid is a little more stable than these large systems? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good question, and it actually makes me realize I did kind of give short shrift to another possible way to balance out some of the intermittency, which is that if you have a, a large network, you know, across the western United States, for example. You know, so it's cloudy in LA, it's sunny in Nevada, you know, that, that's no, you know, then you can kind of work it out. So yes, to some extent, but it does get a little complicated. First of all, you know, we've, we want to favor in-state energy in California. So I don't know, you know, how well we're going to play as a, as a kind of region of the United States together. But I think eventually we can get to a, you know, kind of balance it out in a, in a regional way like that. But, you know, from an individual standpoint, if you, if you sunk a lot of money, uh, into a, in other words, it may involve a little bit of some curtailment of energy. I think that's where we might be heading. So if you invested in an individual solar farm, you know, you may get to the point where, you know, to try to keep things level, you're, not all of your energy is going to be purchased. It's not going to be taken. And so, you know, what happens then? You you signed contracts expecting to get paid for a certain amount. And and if we really truly get to a place where we're, you know, super renewable across the across the region, you know, the western region of the United States. You know what we what we kind of need to do is get to an overproduction point mm -hmm. where then we can you know as things kind of up and down we're okay but that means that some people aren't going to get paid. Uh, that I mean there are others maybe more expert on this than I am but that's that's one of the problems that I see with it. Um, but yeah and and with distributed generation it may have the same problem if you have homeowners whose systems are kind of getting shut off. I mean we're not there yet but yes you're right the more distributed we are the more of a reason the more balancing we can do but energy storage will if you look at the studies be a critical piece to this it's going to be hard to avoid the need for some sort of technology to address the, 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 the issue and then the other kind of smaller factor I shouldn't say smaller factor is, is demand response and smart grid where basically we have a smarter grid that is automated that communicates so it can take into account these peaks and valleys and send signals to home, shut things down. So we've got refrigerators, for example, that turn on every hour. You don't, they don't need to go on every hour to keep your food from spoiling. You could, they could be delayed. You know, the, 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 the uh, freezing cycle could be delayed five, ten minutes. Your washing machine can be delayed from the start. So if you have a grid that's interacting with appliances and doing that kind of uh, demand response type of, of, uh, of a function where it's actually getting you know, managing the the, uh, the demand a little bit so that it can match with this intermittent supply. And that takes a lot of investments, and that's where the smart grid comes into play, because you now need a sort of talking grid where it's talking to your, to your appliances and, and, uh, and talking to your, your home energy usage. Um, and, there, and, I, and I think there's a lot of incentives, particularly for investor-owned utilities to invest in this, because they can get paid back by rate payers for it, um, but we still do need more investments and more research into how it will work. So some quick take-home points on how to scale up, particularly the energy storage market. A lot of this is about how we're going to monetize those benefits. So if you have a battery that you, or a battery system that you could place along the grid, then what that means is you're not going to have to spend money potentially on other things. You're not going to have to spend money to upgrade uh, some. Of, you're not going to spend money to upgrade that that congested substation potentially, or, or build a new transmission line, or a bigger transmission line. But right now, energy storage technologies can't take advantage of money that you would have spent. Uh, how do you document that you would have, you know, the utility would have spent that money on something else? So figuring out a way where they can capture that value stream of, of avoided investment and things is, is going to be really key. Uh, secondly, opening markets. It's a you know, we're in a regulated structure with electricity. It's monopolies, and it's highly regulated. And a lot of the rules about how energy is supplied favor traditional generators. So, for example, um, when a, uh, a great example is, uh, is is a rule that FERC had, had put out, where basically energy providers would get paid on hourly increments for the for the electricity they apply, supply over an hour. Well, certain technologies like flywheels can outperform a traditional fossil fuel-based generator in a 15-minute interval because they have short bursts of power. It was spinning disks that you know they can't spin forever, but you can pull off energy for short bursts. And by changing this, the time frame of the market. From an hour to 15 minutes suddenly it becomes competitive for, for flywheels. So you know, there, there are some fixes that are they don't require subsidies or mandates or anything. They're just about opening markets to the technologies. Uh, having said that, though, I think we do need more incentives for energy storage. California's gone a good way allowing the 
self-generating incentive program to cover energy storage technologies, and we have some research dollars, uh, but we need more of it for demonstration projects and more dollars for, the, for transportation. Uh, sorry, not for transportation, but for, uh, for investment in, uh, in battery research. And the interesting wild card here is electric vehicles, because electric vehicles, of course, need batteries to operate. And what that means is we're getting to a point as you have major automobile makers like Nissan investing literally billions of dollars in battery technology that we're suddenly seeing you know, the potential for some major breakthroughs and major decreases in costs as we bring down manufacturing costs. And the nice thing about that is that you've got, this is private investment in these technologies. This is not you know, government subsidies. Every time you go in to buy a Leaf or a Volt, you know, in a sense you're subsidizing battery research. The other interesting part about electric vehicles is that you have the potential to provide some grid services with those electric vehicles. Let's say we could get by 2025 a million and a half electric vehicles they're all charging at night. You know, for a grid operator, that's a nice source of, uh, of potentially balancing uh, of, of the grid. So it's not so much that those batteries and the cars are going to put electricity back into the grid, but they may you may be able to control their rate of charging. So they charge you know at high rates and then and low and, and lower rates depending on the needs of the grid. So it becomes an interesting network and a tool for grid operators, potentially a way to get paid by owning an electric vehicle because you're providing a grid service. Uh, so that can help lower the costs. Of, of purchasing an electric vehicle. And then finally, uh, you've got second life uh, options for the battery. So you drive an electric vehicle after about seven years, that battery is no longer going to work in your car, but you can now sell it to a utility. It's, it's still got a good life there, right? 70, 80% capacity. You can sell it to a utility, you could buy all these second you know, used batteries, aggregate them, and you've got a, a, a bulk energy storage option. And it's also something, again, that can bring down the cost of buying that electric vehicle. So uh, those are just some of the areas I wanted to flag for your attention. So you know, as, as a kind of a summary, I just wanted to kind of recap that California is really taking a leadership position here when it comes to addressing climate change. We're scaling up some industries that are bringing in a lot of private investment into California uh, and, uh, and are leading to some jobs and investment, uh, uh, whether it's land use and uh, addressing the vehicle miles traveled question, uh, looking at the retrofit. Uh, stock of housing that's available, and particularly trying to focus on those areas where it makes the most sense. You know, it's easy for people in Berkeley or La Jolla to say, hey, I got an energy efficient house, but you know, they're in pretty mild climates. We really want to focus on, you know, folks in the Mojave Desert and then maybe in the Valley area where it's hot and you have colder winters and hot summers. But uh, we're trying to innovate some of those programs. And then the uh, clean tech innovations that have been happening, Silicon Valley, you know, a lot of venture capital, biofuels, uh, solar installers, energy storage. And I think we've seen jobs result uh, from, from that kind of investment. And then finally, you know, it's hard to imagine, but there could come a point where, uh, at a federal level, we may get a consensus that we need to address the climate problem. And uh, you know, it, may, it may just start with bits and pieces, you know, energy efficiency standards, renewable energy standards. But the fact that California is doing this now, we're kind of a guinea pig, cap and trade program, I think, is a good, a, a good example of that, where if we can get it right in California, it may become a model. You know, similarly to how the Massachusetts healthcare program was a model for national healthcare, so you know, we, hopefully we'll see something. Uh, not that Mitt Romney wants to admit to that, but um, this is my, my pundit side. Uh, and so we'll see what happens. But I think it's an exciting time to be in California because the public is behind us, uh, the market is behind it, and uh, you know, and that, and that makes all the difference in the world. And we're seeing the leadership, you know, if not in other areas in the state, certainly on the environment. And here's my contact info. Uh, I'd be happy to take questions now. And if any of you are interested in the white papers, like I said, there's a few up here. You can download them from uh, from these websites. And we've got a blog, a joint UCLA UC Berkeley blog. And uh, Reed, any of my colleague from UCLA is here, and he blogs on there. And uh, yeah, so we're we're uh, we're always opining about what's going on in California. So thank you very much, and happy to take questions. question. I, mean, I think you know, I, so, some of the policy ideas that I had, you know, for each area, I think kind of encapsulate immediate next steps for any given issue area. 
Uh, I think we already have some great leadership happening in the state. I mean, we're, we're really well ahead of the game. Air Resources Board is really on top of a lot of these things. Legislature, too. The challenge is we don't have a lot of money, resources to invest in this. You know, in almost every workshop that we had, financing came up as a big issue. Because essentially what we're trying to do is transition to a different kind of economy. And we need to invest up front in things that will benefit us down the road. But so, you know, you think about next steps, it's things like, you know, providing local governments with that planning money so they can plan for better communities. You can do that up front, you save a lot of money, you get much better communities because the developers aren't doing this ad hoc. It saves them money, they can build bigger units, more units. Um, so, you know, that's part of it. Planning for renewable energy means you can address a lot of the environmental issues, um, not on a project by project basis, but on a kind of regional scale. Uh, that's a big part of it. Certainly financing improvements to the building stock, so trying to get PACE revitalized, um, trying to figure out ways of, of getting money in the hands of people who want to do those kind of things. And then, of course, investment in, in renewables and energy storage. A lot of that's happening on the private sector side. The public sector can do a lot, too. But one thing I didn't mention about energy storage, for example, is that the legislature passed a law saying that the Public Utilities Commission can actually mandate that utilities buy a certain amount of energy storage uh, technologies. And there's a proceeding now that's going on, uh, and I, you know they may they may not set mandates, but I mean there are some levers there. If they wanted to, they could really jumpstart what utilities have to do, and jumpstart potentially an energy storage market. Um, and on, at, at every one of these, you know, I, rec I encourage you to come look at the white papers. We've got a lot of recommendations for federal, state, local leaders can do what the businesses themselves can do for best practices. So there's a lot of a lot of things, but the good news is I think we're on the right path as much as we can be in the state. Other questions? Well, you mentioned the fast tracking with respect to infill and 375. Well, what about on renewables? Is there movement in that area to fast track the approval? Yeah, and the Energy Commission, for example, has gotten a lot better about you know, improving the process. Um, in terms of environmental reviews and, and, and streamlining things, the uh, Energy Commission has a, probably a better, well, I shouldn't say better, but a faster environmental review process. Uh, they, have, they have a kind of a special carve-out for permitting uh, solar thermal projects. And, and some of the projects start out as solar thermal and switch to PV, which would have put them out of CEC jurisdiction. We're by, by statute allowed to stay in the CEC, and there's, there's kind of a, you know, from a developer perspective, potentially a better process there. Uh, governor's office has looked into uh, that issue of trying to streamline. I think their idea about regional and local planning is an effort to streamline, because you've got those programmatic documents done, you do an assessment at a bigger scale so the projects can then benefit from that. Um, so it's definitely something that people are aware of. But those unforeseeable issues, you know, endangered species is a big one. You just don't know how many tortoises are going to be there until, you know, I mean, you do a survey. They did one up at uh, the Ivanpah project. Los Angeles Times had a big profile of it. And they thought there were going to be, you know, X many tortoises. And they turned out there was a mother load of tortoises. And, you know, they tried to put them in pens, and they all kind of went crazy in there. And, I mean, it's pretty heartbreaking stuff. Um, and, uh, and there's only so much you can do. You know, you just do your assessments. But until you get in there, you never really know. So and same thing with archaeological impacts, you know, sometimes you start digging in the well, there's a burial ground. So. Do any of the white papers cover the uh, issue you mentioned of uh, EV battery second life? Uh, um, that's kind of an evolving yeah. area. So we did, a, we did a paper on energy storage, and I think we mentioned it in there. Um, we also did another project, uh, after our bending from the Energy Commission here oversaw, uh, a research, pretty in-depth research project that we did on energy storage, uh, kind of a vision for energy storage for 2020. We talked about that as a potential option. I think you know, the basic conclusion that we got out of it was that there needs to be a little bit more research done about you know, how these Second Life batteries are going to perform in a utility application, utility scale application. So that may be a question mark, but um, I think it's a very promising area. I'm, I'm pretty interested in it myself. I mean, I think that if you can monetize that sale down the road up front, you could potentially knock off the cost of electric vehicles by potentially a lot of, a lot of money. I mean, if a battery new costs fifteen thousand dollars, but you can sell it used for maybe ten thousand dollars at eighty percent capacity, you know, if you can just give people six or eight thousand dollars of that up front, that's a huge amount to reduce off the sticker price of an electric vehicle. So uh, I, I, we may have mentioned that in this white paper, but if not, we, we did another report for the Energy Commission. You know, we're, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I don't know. I work, I talk to engineers, but I don't know that, you know, I'm not an expert on the kind of engineering implications of doing that. But certainly from a policy standpoint, it's very promising. 
So you talked a lot about California and California initiatives, and I'm wondering, you know, the way it's worked historically is that we have policy innovation in states, and states learn from one another, and you see this sort of contagion effect taking over, and innovation happens as a consequence. Are we seeing any of that? We certainly see it with automobiles, but are we seeing any of it with other kinds of energy efficiency? Yeah, great question. You know, it's, I don't mean to make it sound like we, we're doing everything the best here. I and mean, there are a lot of areas in the environmental space where I think California is lagging, and we can learn from other states. I mean, on the land use side, I think it's pretty widely recognized that states such as Maryland, Washington, Oregon are much better about how their land use patterns take shape. Uh, you know, they're kind of called smart growth states, but it's just a, it's a little more state directed kind of a process. Um, and we, you know, we're much more decentralized here in California. I mean, it's voter revolt time if you try to mess with local authority over land use. So, and that's an area where I think we can learn some things uh, on the energy efficiency side. Absolutely, there's uh, been a lot of innovation around the world on energy efficiency. New York City has a pretty strict ordinance about commercial buildings needing to get retrofitted every 10 years, I think, or they have to meet some sort of standard. Um, Maine has some legislation, Austin, Texas, uh, requiring energy audits, you know, at time of sale of a, of a property. Um, England, uh, Great Britain, I never know how to say it, uh, they have, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact program that they have, but there's a whole disclosure about energy usage before you buy a home. Yeah. Um, that's right. Okay, that's good. So, I was saying that encrypted, it. but uh, yeah. So maybe that's an example of uh, where other jurisdictions are are farther ahead of us on energy efficiency. Energy storage certainly we've learned from other states. Texas is pretty good on energy storage. I think because they have so many kind of stranded wind farms, um, <laughs> they want to do something with. But um, and some of the uh, ISOs and other jurisdictions have had some pretty innovative policies that we can learn from. But I think we we might be the farthest ahead on energy storage because we have this. Uh, the law that directs this proceeding to happen, which empowers the Public Utilities Commission to do the mandates. And we also have a lot of research, a lot of technologies based here, but Japan has done a lot with batteries. I mean, you think about the arguments for energy storage, people say, well, it's very expensive. I mean, how much would batteries have cost at the Fukushima nuclear plant? You know, and if, we could have, if they could have kept that thing running for a few more days, I mean, think of how many hundreds of billions of dollars, you know, attendant lives could have been saved. You know, so how much would on-site batteries? I think they had some on-site batteries there, they just weren't enough. So, you know, you think about those kind of catastrophic scenarios, you know, investment energy storage seems pretty cheap. So I think Japan, and I think China's also doing some stuff on energy storage. Um, the renewables, I mean, I mentioned Germany, and um, Italy, Spain, they all had pretty comprehensive feed-in tariff programs. Uh, electric vehicles, you know, we can look at Israel uh, as, as pretty advanced. Um, so, yeah, we're not, you know, we're not the best here, but I think we're pretty good. You mentioned the renewable energy goals. What are the consequences under the laws or whatever they are if we don't meet the goals in, uh, in 2030? You know, it kind of reminds me of the scene from uh, Team America, if any of you have seen that movie, where they kind of make fun of Hans Blix, uh, the UN uh, weapons inspector, you know, going to talk to a North Korean leader and saying, you know, if you don't do this, we're going to write you a, a very sternly worded letter expressing how upset we are with you. <laughs> You know, so I think basically that's probably what they get, you know, very sternly, I, I don't know, I'm just saying this somewhat flippantly, but uh, I mean, there was no consequences for them not meeting the 2010 goal. Now, of course, they were on pace, so I think people felt like it was okay. Um, and this, there are penalties available. Uh, they could levy fines uh, for not complying. I mean, there could be, you know, daily penalties every time, they're, every, every day they're not in compliance. So there are enforcement mechanisms. The question is, politically and otherwise, you know, does the Public Utilities Commission want to really clamp down? But look, the, the utilities are responding. You know, I mean, they're 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 moving in that direction. So, um, and you know, I think we'll just have to kind of see. You know, this is all just targets, and we're hoping they can get there. But there may be reasons that are out of their control why they can't meet the target. Um, so, you know, we'll have to just kind of see what happens when we get out there and see where you know what the what, the, what life is like on the ground. The renewable goal. Is it clear that that should be generation as opposed to usage? Sales. Sales, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, so it's 33 percent of the energy generated in California has to come from renewable sources. No, sales. 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 Yeah, that's sales. what I thought, yeah. I know here locally, you know, quite a bit of the renewable is, comes down from Oregon or wherever. Yeah, so you're in the, in the SMUD territory, right? Uh, I, I'll have to go back and double check, but I, I thought it was... Uh, okay. All right. Okay, so we're getting all right. So maybe it's retail sales. Which incorporates usage, because that's how much sales are. Yeah, right. It's yeah. Usage yeah. Sales so it's all, it all, but, you know, 
the shovels that they should be no, generated. <laughs> yeah, but my understanding was that it was a ge energy generated had to come from yeah, well, renewable sources. Yeah, but, 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 yeah, so sales. Sales. Okay, all right. All right I'm getting a uh, veto here, so it's definitely sales. Um, and uh, and I shall say the definition of, of what a renewable energy source is becomes controversial as well. So, for example, we've excluded large hydro from renewable renewable portfolio. Small hydro is okay. You know, I mean, is nuclear renewable? You know, probably not. But you could you know you could make an argument. At least it's not not carbon based. Any other questions? Thanks very much. Oh, wait, a question. Oh, one more. Just briefly, how do we get the public on board with this? Aside from giving them financial means to do it, are are people persuaded? What does your um, yeah, marketing and outreach is, is, is a key part of almost every issue that we've come across. Some of it, you know, it kind of happens on its own. You know, I think with renewable energy on rooftops, for example, you know, there's, it's, it's easy, you know, a little easier to do. It's high profile. Things like energy efficiency, you really got to just get the word out and, and make the case. You need a good marketing campaign. You know, people cite examples, um, you know, of different kind of public education campaigns. You know, anti-tobacco campaign is one example. You know, how do we really let people think first about efficiency and retrofit improvements? Um, you know, electric vehicles, that's another challenge. You know, convincing people that the uh, car's not going to explode, you know, that you're not driving a big golf cart. You know, it's, it, it, it may take the people who drive the cars to make the case to their friends and neighbors. And then I think in terms of the overarching vision, you know, we just need some good leadership. And I guess this alludes back to what I was saying at the beginning of the talk about the environmental movement, you know, that it, it's hard to really think about who's presenting a very positive vision for where we can go as a state, you know, environmentally. You know, environmentalists, I think, are very, you know, they're split, and a lot of their focus on narrow issues, you know, but who's really presenting a compelling vision for what we can do in California, you know, the kind of lifestyle that we can lead. I mean, I think it could be an exciting vision for a lot of people to truly live in a, in a resource-efficient, you know, self-sustaining community where, that, that you're benefiting your local environment, your local economy. All the money that we send to utilities, to gas companies, Natural gas, oil companies, you know, every time you turn on the light, you know, think of the waste, think of, of the entities you're enriching, and the idea you can put together a compelling argument that you know, this is a way to empower people, to empower yourself, to, you can feel good about you know, turning on the light switch because you know it's coming from a clean source that's generated locally, it's providing local jobs, and it may be cheaper you know, as a result. So you have smart grid applications telling appliances to shut off, it could be saving you electricity, allowing you to manage your electricity portfolio better. So certainly on the energy side, I think there's a really positive argument to be made there. And on the land use side as well, you know, I think like I, like I was saying in the beginning, it's not about Soviet-style planning. This is about giving people a revitalized community, a, a good downtown, housing options, you know, a, a variety of options, an easier way to get around, more convenience. I mean, if you sell it like that, it, you know, it's, it's exciting to people, and I think it, you know, it can make people feel positive about the future rather than just demoralized and depressed and powerless about you know, the climate uh, changes that we're in, in store for, and you know the lack of control we have over our lives, and how you know how we you know, the trade-offs we all have to make for enjoying the lifestyle that we do. So I hope that environmentalists can focus more on that. You know, but right now, honestly, you're seeing more leadership on climate change from venture capitalists than you are from environmentalists. I hate to say it, but they're the ones who are solving the problem, not not the environmentalists. And I, sh I, mean, I don't mean to paint a broad brush, because certainly a lot of environmentalists doing great work on renewables, on land use. But not in a cohesive way. We don't have that kind of movement uh, from from that quarter. Have you looked at the uh, public health aspect of co-benefits of active transportation? I saw a study on that that was pretty recent. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a, it's a great point. The public health it is a huge part of the equation, particularly on the land use side. Although it is on really all of this. I mean, we talk about carbon, but all these, these carbon emissions come with hazardous pollution as well in a lot of cases. I mean, these power plants, not just the greenhouse gases we're worried about, but all sorts of hazardous air pollutants. Um, and on the land use side, you know, when you have to have people driving a lot, uh, first of all, they're not healthy. Second of all, people are living next to freeways, they're not active. So public, public health sector is very interested in land use patterns, and we've worked with some of those folks. Uh, it's just another great argument, I think, in favor of doing this anyways. Um, it, it, sometimes they butt up against each other. It's, it's interesting because you know, some of the best infill sites are next to major roadways. And, you know, the studies show that it's not good for kids to live next to a big roadway, but, you know, if it's a great infill spot and people want to live there, you know, so there, the, the barrier, for example, had a rule uh, calling into question development, 
their air quality management about building next to these some of these busier roads. And it was tough. The infill builders were upset about it because it was taking away potentially a large area because urban areas are heavily impacted. But you know, it's, it's, it's something that needs to be traded. I think there are some compromises. You can put in some mitigation technologies, you know, air filters, certain kinds of windows that really dramatically reduce the risk for people who live in these areas. We're not talking about building right next to a freeway, but even just a kind of busy road can cause health impacts. But generally, the public health community is very interested in this, the act of transportation, the reducing the driving, reducing the pollution, cleaning up our energy system. Thank you very much. Come get white papers if you want. So I don't have to drive with me. Okay, yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah, I'll try to set up earlier.